Hello everyone, uh, this is John Buck. Welcome back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. In this video, we're going to talk about the Discrete Time Fourier Transform. Uh, the Fourier Transform is like a cousin of the Fourier series. We've seen already the Fourier series is a really great technique for helping us think about periodic signals and particularly what filters do, them because we, do to them because we've seen we can think of the Fourier series as like a recipe to think about how do I make a time domain signal out of a weighted sum of complex exponentials that are harmonics. Uh, and that, that has a lot of great advantages we've already seen, particularly it often is, is nice to be able to worry about just one frequency at a time. And so it's very natural to say, well, is there a way we can do something like that for signals that aren't periodic? And the answer to that is the Fourier transform will do that for many signals. The same basic idea that we can think of this time domain signal as a weighted sum of complex exponentials of different frequencies. So we'll see it gets a little more complicated when the signals aren't periodic, but the underlying concept is basically the same thing, and we get a lot of the same advantages in that we're able to worry about things just one frequency at a time. Okay, so let's see how that works. So again, the topic for tonight's video is the discrete time Fourier transform, uh, and particularly the, uh, the transform uh, definition is pretty straightforward. Uh, that we we write this as a function of e to the j omega and, and and because those are the complex these are the frequencies in the complex exponential um, and so this is this first equation is often called the analysis equation because it lets us analyze the signal x of n to find how much of each frequency is in it so x of e to the j omega these are like the a of k's we saw in the Fourier series but we now have one for every omega uh, and, and so it has similar informants as sum over n of x of n e to the minus j omega n. But instead of just summing over one period now, we sum over forever. So it's almost like, and this is kind of fuzzy mathematical thinking, but conceptually it's not too wrong to think about. It's like we took the periodic signal and pushed the period out to forever. And then we'd say, well, then I'd have an infinite period, so I'd need to take an infinite sum. The other thing that does, if we think about it, though, is we say, well, well then... What happened to omega naught, our fundamental frequency? Well, it's 2 pi over n. As n goes to infinity, the frequencies, the harmonics, get infinitely close together. When things get infinitely close together, we end up with integrals. And so the synthesis equation, while the analysis equation is not too different from what we saw for finding the a sub k's, the synthesis equation is different. Right? This we call the synthesis equation. This is the one that's like the recipe, where again, it's saying I'm going to take one comp each of these complex exponentials so this is, this is the frequency part, or these are the, the building blocks, these are the ingredients if you want to think of it like a recipe. And this is how much of each ingredient, the magnitude and phase for each ingredient goes in. But now instead of just taking the sum over k ingredients, because our, our fundamental frequency is, is essentially gone um, to, to almost to zero, we have an infinite family of, our, instead of just having it n of these, we have an infinite set. When I take a sum of an infinite number of things arbitrarily close together, the sigma turns into an integral. So I get this integral here, and then I have a 1 over 2 pi. So what this says is if I know the Fourier transform, I can find the time signal by doing this integral of e to the j omega n weighted by the, this is the Fourier transform, just over one period from minus pi to pi, uh, and then we're scaling it by 1 over 2 pi. This is a, basically a bookkeeping detail. But a natural question is saying, well, why is the integral over, only over an interval from minus pi to pi? This is something we, we've touched on briefly before, but it's worth coming back to, that in discrete time, pi is the highest effective frequency. That anything above that is just repeating a frequency we've seen before. So effectively, that you can't go any higher than pi. One of the consequences of this is that the DTFT, the discrete time Fourier transform, is periodic in frequency. Not a, we've seen signals periodic in time already, but this is periodic in omega every 2 pi. And this is sort of like the way that for the DTFS, the coefficients were periodic every, right? They're periodic in k the same way they were periodic in time. And to see why this must be true, we can, we can say, well, what happens just starting from that to sum up above, if I add 2 pi to omega, I can plug in and see that what I get is, is x of n e to the minus j 
And now I put in omega plus 2 pi here, n. And if I use properties of exponentials, I say, well, I can turn that sum in the exponential into, I can distribute it through, and then I have a sum of two things in an exponent. I can rewrite that as a product of the same base with the two exponents, right? So I can say this is like x of n e to the minus j omega n times e to the minus j 2 pi n. But using Euler's relationship, this last exponential we can say is cosine of 2 pi n, uh, well, minus 2 pi n, uh, plus j of sine minus 2 pi n. But if n is an integer, which it always is in, in, in our time things here, then the, every integer multiple of 2 pi will be 1. Every integer multiple uh, this cosine of integer multiples of 2 pi is 1, rather, excuse me. The sine of multiples of 2 pi over n is 0. So this whole thing is just a complicated way to write the number 1. I'm multiplying by 1 here. And so what's left over here is my original x of e to the j omega. Right? This is the same definition I had up at the top of the page. And so by shifting by 2 pi in frequency, it turns out I get exactly the same thing back because time is discrete in this equation. And so that says I only need, in terms of ingredients, when I think about the Fourier synthesis equation, how many different exponentials do I need, or what range of omegas do I need? It says I only need to go from minus pi to pi. Once I have something that's 2 pi wide, I've covered all of the, the uh, frequencies I can use, anything after that just turns out to be the same as, as one of these other terms, and there's no point in, in using it twice in the integral. So that's why the integral goes from minus pi to pi. So the one other thing I, I wanted to mention is, is let's talk briefly about the convergence. Wrong color, sorry about that. Or the DTFT. It turns out that infinite sum isn't guaranteed to converge, right? So when, the question we want to know is when does this equation for the Fourier transform, x of e to the j omega is a function of omega, when does this infinite sum converge? As in, when do we have a meaningful Fourier transform? Or when are we guaranteed to have a Fourier transform? Well, there are a couple of rules for it. Uh, there's two conditions. If the sequence x of n is absolutely summable, so if I take the sum from minus infinity to plus infinity of x, absolute value of x of n, if that's absolutely summable, then x of e to the j omega converges or exists. We have a, a valid Fourier transform. And another condition, there's, there's another condition we can use. If the signal x of n has finite energy, so if I take the sum from minus infinity to plus infinity of x of n magnitude squared, and that's less than infinity, we can also say x of e to the j omega converges. And finally, another condition that sort of simply solves either one of those is if x of n has finite length. right, then both of these are satisfied, right? If I have a finite length signal, so there's only a finite number of values of x of n in it, the sum of its their absolute values or their squareds will be finite. And that's important because in practice, in real life, signals we deal with are finite length. I can only measure a signal for so long before I run out of memory or time to record it. Or, or a due date for some project, right? So practical signals in real life are finite length. And so that means that the Fourier transform does exist for any practical signal we're ever going to record as working engineers, whether right, any, any uh, musical song has a finite amount of length, any, uh, any record we're going to, uh, you know, any musical record we're going to record, anything like that is, is finite in length. So in, in practice, you know, we might worry about the convergence for certain mathematical things or theoretical things, but in, in practical work, things always converge. We always have the Fourier transform. 
So I'm going to stop this video for here. There are accompanying videos that show examples of computing Fourier transforms of common kinds of signals, common kinds of signals, like uh, decaying exponentials uh, and, and rectangular pulses uh, that you can watch uh, also on the channel. So those are, are uh, also available to show you examples of how we use this to find Fourier transforms. All right, that's all for now. I will see you all next time.